This is the Korean Peninsula, home to 78 million Koreans. This is that famous line between the two Koreas. 52 million Koreans south of this line are South Koreans, and 26 million Koreans north of this line are North Koreans. But Koreans don't just live here. There are as many as 7.3 million Koreans living outside this peninsula. About 820,000 of them live in Japan. 485,000 live in former Soviet Union countries. About 2.9 million of them live in North America. And over 1.89 million Koreans are citizens of China. They are known as the Korean Chinese. In Northeast China, there are 54 ethnic Korean towns and villages scattered all over. But the vast majority, about 60% of the 1.89 million Korean Chinese, were born and raised in this swath of land just north of North Korea. It looks tiny on the Chinese map, but if you compare its size with the two Koreas, you will find it larger than you think. It's over 38% of North Korea's land area and 46% of South Korea's. It's not just some K-towns in the vast with a couple of Korean malls, restaurants, and karaoke's. It is a legit Korean region with its own culture and history. Walking around here, you will find everything written in two languages, sometimes even three, and everybody you meet is perfectly bilingual. You will find some of the most delicious Korean food, beautiful Korean-style buildings, pepper that is a little too red to look at, grandmas dancing passionately, and even some famous DJs from South Korea. Anyways, it is a unique Korean experience that combines North Korea, South Korea, Japan, Russia, and China. Something that just doesn't exist anywhere else. It is made up of two administrative regions, Yenbyen Korean Autonomous Prefecture and Changbai Korean Autonomous County. It is the home to some of the most sacred mountains, lakes, and rivers in Northeast Asia, and the home to some of the most influential figures in Korean history, such as this guy. But the story I'm going to share with you today isn't just about Changbai and Yenbyen. I'm also sharing the story behind this line, from the mouth of the Yalu River to the mouth of the Tumen River, its formation, its beauty, and its secrets. Because this 1,352 km border that seemingly cuts off the Korean Peninsula perfectly from China is in fact the epitome of Northeast Asia's history for the past 800 years. Right here on this borderland, in these rivers, at this mountain, empires rose and fell, kingdoms came and went. So in this video, I will take you on a journey to see how people from different cultures mixed here over the centuries to see how Sino-Korean border has formed, deformed, and transformed, to see how the most sacred lake in Northeast Asia was split in two, and more importantly, to see how generations of Koreans live and die at the crossroads of sea and land, Japan, China, the United States and the Soviet Union, capitalism and communism, and at the crossroads of two legendary rivers and one perpetually white mountain. How did the Third Korea form in China? I went to this borderland in late October 2023 and spent a month there. I went from the western end of China-North Korea border to the eastern end from the shore of the Yellow Sea to the coast of the Sea of Japan. I visited many, many interesting places and learned so much. It was a blast. Let's get into it.
as always, but for the story, let's look at the geography. In the year 946, one of the largest and most powerful volcanic eruptions in the last 5,000 years occurred at the juncture of Manchuria and the Korean Peninsula. To be fair, this mountain range has been erupting on and off for at least 2 million years. But this one in 946 was exceptionally powerful. So after the eruption, a gigantic mountain collapsed into an enormous caldera. The Chinese call this mountain Changbaishan, while the Koreans call it Pektusan. Changbaishan means perpetually white mountain in Chinese, and Pektusan means white head mountain. In Korean, so basically the same thing, and I think it's pretty obvious why they name it that way. Look at this place! Oh my god, the highest mountain in China's northeast and the Korean Peninsula. Look at how gray down there and how white up here <sighs> perpetually white mountain white head mountain huh yeah, tell me about it <sighs> it's freezing cold up here by the way minus 20 something minus close to minus 30 degrees celsius and way colder than the north pole i've got my south 99% covered, but still, I, I find the weather here very, very unforgiving. Oh god. Whew. I can barely feel my feet. And this is just the beginning. A little worried about the rest of the day. So over the years, the caldera began to collect a vast amount of water and uh, a lake was formed. It is known as the Heaven Lake. And here it is. Absolutely breathtaking. That is North Korea. This mountain range also gave birth to a number of rivers of different sizes. Among them are two rivers flowing in opposite directions. The one that flows southwest is called the Yalu River, and the one that flows northeast is called the Tumen River. These two rivers and the mountain where they originate are the core of this story. And now let's zoom out a little bit. If you look at this map hard enough, Eventually, you will find the three sisters of the Yellow Sea. The Shandong Peninsula, the Liaodong Peninsula, and the Korean Peninsula. Because aside from the drama of two rivers and one mountain, I'm also covering a bit of the drama between the three sisters. Especially the drama between these two. I'm sure everyone here knows at least a thing or two about the Korean Peninsula, as it is perhaps the most famous peninsula on Earth. But the peninsula right next to it, Liaodong, is almost unknown to people outside of Northeast Asia. Which is a shame, because this peninsula, at the crossroads of the Mongolian Plateau, Korean Peninsula, Manchuria, and China proper, played a much bigger role in the history of Northeast Asia than anywhere else. Every war fought in this part of the world in the past 1,000 years had something to do with Liaodong. In fact, to this very day, Liaoning province, where Liaodong is, is still the most culturally diverse region in Northeast China. As of 2010, it had the largest Manchu population in the world, 
Over 5.3 million Manchus live here. It also has the largest Mongol population outside of Inner Mongolia and Mongolia. Over 670,000 Mongols live here. That is more than the entire Mongol population in Russia. Liaodong was also home to the Russian and Japanese navies for decades and has thousands of Russian and Japanese buildings, many of which are still in use. On the southernmost tip of the peninsula, there is a city called Dalian. And if you take the metro there, you will hear announcements in five languages. Chinese, English, Japanese, Korean, Russian. Because Liaodong is also home to a quarter of a million ethnic Koreans. I've been, to, uh, I've been to many interesting places in the world, but Liaodong is definitely something else. When filming for this project, I took a bus to go from one city to another. The bus went along the Yalu River. It was a five hour drive, and every time the driver stopped for a bathroom break, we were in a different ethnic village. Sometimes we were in a Manchu village, sometimes a Han village, and sometimes a Korean village. It was just fascinating. And to better understand the complexity of Liaodong, we must go back to the 13th century, when the Korean Koryo Kingdom became a vassal state of the Mongol Yuan Empire. You see, after Koryo submitted, the Mongols made three plans for this new frontier. The first plan was rather straightforward, to leverage the resources of the Korean Peninsula for the upcoming wars in the southeast with the Japanese, which we all know failed miserably and kind of give birth to this kamikaze. The second plan focused more on the peninsula itself. The goal was to break Koryo into pieces to prevent the formation of a strong central government. In 1258, Mongols annexed northeastern Koryo and established the Sangsong prefecture. In 1270, Mongols annexed northwestern Koryo and established the Tongyong prefecture. And that's not all. Down here in Teju Island, the Mongols established the Tamla prefecture in 1274 to oversee southern Koryo and Japan. And there was a third plan going on, focusing on the northwest. It was much more convoluted than the other two plans and would affect the Sino-Korean relations for hundreds of years to come, even leading to the rise and fall of not just one, but several kingdoms and empires. The third plan was aimed at reviving the Korean colonization of Liaodong. To be fair, this wasn't the first time Koreans lived in Liaodong. Back in the days of Ko Joseon Kingdom, Ko Koryo Kingdom, the Asian Koreans roamed around this region for centuries until Asian Chinese and Asian nomads pushed them back. As a matter of fact, there are still many traces of their culture left in Liaodong. Ko Koryo's 700 year history left behind a wealth of relics and uh, artifacts in Ji'an. When counted in 1966, there were over 10,000 Asian tombs, like this one behind me, scattered all over this region, most of which were relics left by Kokulio from the 3rd to the 7th centuries. The 19th ruler of Kokoryo Empire was built right here, literally less than one mile away from North Korea. And after King Kwangkido died in 413, his son moved the capital to Pyongyang in 427. And Pyongyang, the city I cannot visit on this trip, unfortunately, has played a central role in Korean history ever since. Uh, by the way, this is actually uh, the tomb of King Kwangkido's son. So the 20th ruler of Kokuro Kingdom was built here. 
and I have to take my word back since I said there were over 10,000 tomes like this one. No, there was only one tome like this. He's the guy who moved uh, the capital from uh, here to Pyongyang. It reminds me of uh, Chichen Itza and Machu Picchu. But after the fall of Kokoryo Kingdom in 668, for nearly 600 years, the Koreans had largely disappeared from Liaodong as the nomads from Manchuria rose to power one by one and pushed them to the south. So by the mid-13th century when Mongols established their control in Liaodong, this region was populated by various Jurchen tribes, Kitan aristocrats, ambitious Chinese magnates, and an unusual concentration of Mongol princes. The most important of them were the houses of the three forebrothers of Genghis Khan, known as the three princely houses of the eastern regions who represented the most powerful military bloc in the Mongol Empire and were directly responsible for Kublai's rise to power. Had these eastern princes not joined forces with him, Kublai would have likely lost the succession war to his brother, and we would all live in a very different reality. Anyways, it appeared that the Mongols owed these groups with conflicts of interest, overlapping territories, mixed intentions, and very questionable loyalties in Liaodong still weren't messy enough so they decided to bring the Koreans to the party. Over the 13th century, about a quarter million Koreans left the Korean Peninsula. Many moved to the big cities like Daidu, Shangdu, and Walsi Jiangnan regions for jobs and marriages, but most settled in Liaodong. And just to make things in Liaodong a bit more complicated for everyone, the Mongols divided these Liaodong Koreans among three families. The Mongols' Korean ally, the Hong family, the Korean royals, the Wang family, and the double royals, known as Prince Semyang. Prince Semyang had both the Mongol and Korean royal blood in them, and they actually had another title outside Liaodong, the King of Koryo. Yeah, I know, confusing. The power struggle between these three families in Liaodong was an epic Korean drama, which is something Netflix producers should really start working on. But for us, the takeaway is that while the Mongols were in charge, the official Korean territories looked like this. But the unofficial Korean territories went all the way up there, including almost all of Liaodong. However, the Mongols were not going to be in charge for long, and their drama was even more epic than the Koreans. After Kublai Khan died, the Yuan Empire saw nine Khans in just 38 years. The conflicts in the court quickly escalated to coups and assassinations, leading to a bloody civil war between the two capitals that destroyed Shangdu and much of the Mongol troops. The Yuan Empire never recovered from this. Meanwhile, multiple crises hit the Mongols all at once. The Yellow River flooded, an epidemic ravaged the land, cold weather took hold, famine spread, and one Buddhist cult in China proper that warned of an impending apocalypse was quickly gaining popularity among the Chinese. His followers called themselves the Red Turbans. The season finale for the Mongol Yuan Empire was approaching. I have a confession to make. When I first got to the bank of the Yalu, the thing that shocked me the most was not these lifeless houses across the river that make Chernobyl look like a kindergarten. Was not the armed North Korean guard that always kept a watchful eye on you. And definitely was not this mystical gargantuan ship that only showed up at night. The thing that shocked me the most was this grandpas who swam to the North Korean shore in broad daylight every single day. You know, we've all met guys who just have to brag about their big balls. Trust me, they do not know what the words mean. Next time you meet people like that, just dare them to swim to North Korea. See if that will silence them. Well, one thing is for sure, that could not silence me. 
because I'm not one of those guys who just talk the talk. I walk the walk, or in this case, swim the swim. In arguably the deadliest river with the highest body count in Northeast Asia, the Yang River. However, the day I picked to swim the Yalu was not like this. It was cold and bleak, and there were still issues to be dealt with. I didn't bring any gear except for my swimming trunks, which I expected to wear in a hot spring, not for a cold swim. But thanks to my cheerfulness and unparalleled ingenuity, I managed to borrow all the necessary equipment for the journey. And now, after a bone-crushingly cold shower in the swimming club, yeah, this grandpa's built a swimming club. I was ready. After explaining that I was a good athlete, jogging five miles every day and running a half marathon every month, what I really needed were a few supportive words telling me that what I was doing was the right thing. It turned out that my cheerfulness was not shared by others. <laughs> As the grandpas were deciding who to lead me and who was strong enough to rescue me, I waded into the river. Despite the frigid temperature and the murky depths, I was determined to complete this challenge. But as my strokes propelled me towards the North Korean shore, I realized this river was trying to pull me under. And as I neared the midpoint of the midpoint of the midpoint of my aquatic journey, the water temperature dropped even further, and the strong currents began to take their toll. Despite my unwavering determination, my strokes became labored, my muscles aching with the cold. The North Korean shore seemed to recede further with each stroke. With a heavy heart, I decided to abandon this mission and turn back before some fishermen found me dead in the Yellow Sea. I was so cold and so blind, I couldn't see my one foot long snot dangling from my nose. So yeah, this river has bested me. But you know what? I was not embarrassed. After all, it's not every day you get to swim in the Yellow River, even if it does nearly give you hypothermia. Can't feel my legs. So fucking hard, man. All right, that's a wrap. Don't think I'm gonna do it again. Nope. Religion flourished during the crisis. The Red Turbans quickly grew into the largest rebellion of the 14th century and led to the fall of the Yuan Empire. The rebellion reshaped millions of lives, especially the lives of two young men. One of them who had spent most of his life as a monk and beggar joined the rebel army at 25 in 1352. It took him less than eight years to become the leader of a Red Turban faction, and another eight years to push the Mongols out of Daidu. He was the founder of the Ming Empire, Zhu Yuanzhang. The other one also began his military career at 25 on the other side of the Yellow Sea. Unlike Zhu Yuanzhang, who was famous for leading the Red Turbans, this guy was famous for killing the Red Turbans. In the winter of 1361, over 200 thousand red turbans crossed the frozen Yalu River, captured the Kolu capital, and started a massacre. With only 2,000 soldiers, this guy launched a surprise attack and recaptured the capital. The king was pleased and showered this young officer with rewards. But little did he know that this young man would eventually overthrow the Kolu kingdom and become a king himself. He was the founder of the last Korean kingdom, Choson, and his name was Yi Songge. 
After Zhou Yuanzhang founded the Ming Empire in 1368, it took the Chinese another 20 years to cross the Mongol resistance in southern Manchuria. Meanwhile, in northern Manchuria, three Jurchen confederations emerged. The wild Jurchens were known to be the most fearsome. They lived north in the dense forest, from the greater Hingan Mountains in the east to the Sea of Japan in the west. The Haishi Jurchens were the proud descendants of the past Jinnan by royals and nobles. They lived in the valley between the Songali River and the Amur River. And they were the Jianzhou Jurchens, the smallest and the weakest among the three, constantly being bullied by the other two. They were a small confederation of only five tribes, about 50,000 people, and lived in the Mudan River Valley. So, in 1387, with the Mongol problem largely gone, for now, and Liaodong under firm Chinese control, two things happened. Up north, three tribes of the Jianzhou Jurchen Confederation allied with Zhou Yuanzhang and began migrating south, settling in the Tumen and Yalu River valleys. And down south, by the bank of the Yalu River, the Chinese and the Koreans were about to share a border for the first time in over 500 years. And as you can imagine, things quickly got out of control. Zhou Yuanzhang wanted to take over all the Mongol administrations, including this prefecture near the heart of the Korean peninsula, Sangsung. He wanted to set up a garrison there called Tieling to oversee the Koreans, just like what the Mongols had done in the past. So he sent an envoy to Kolyu in the winter of 1387 to notify the Koreans, which triggered a chain reaction that would alter Korean history. Because here's the thing, Sangsung was indeed under Mongol control for over a century, but the Koreans recaptured it in 1356, which was 12 years earlier than the establishment of the Ming Empire. So when the Koreans heard that the Chinese were taking Sangsung, they were furious, they were livid, they were like, okay, you Chinese push out the Mongols from Liaodong, you take Liaodong, fair, we didn't say much about that, although we also have some kind of claim. But now you want Sangsung too? When we took Sangsung back from the Mongols, your empire wasn't even established. The Koryu king was so angry that by April 1388, he decided to go to war with the Chinese and take Liaodong, sending a very clear message that if the Chinese were taking Sangsung, we Koreans were taking this entire peninsula. In a matter of days, the tension between the Chinese and Koreans escalated. And so did the tension among the Koreans. Because you see, there wasn't just anti-Chinese sentiment going around, the pro-Chinese sentiment was also quite popular. And the head of the pro-Chinese officials was none other than General Yi Songke himself, who strongly opposed the war. Well, in the end, General Yi Songke failed to change the king's mind, and worse still, he was ordered to command the army to fight the Chinese. General Yi Song Rui left Tokyo on April 18th with 50,000 soldiers and 20,000 horses and arrived at the bank of Yalu on May 7th. The monsoon season. The monsoon hit hard in May. The Yalu River overflowed, making it super difficult for soldiers to cross. So as a result, many soldiers were unwilling to go on and deserted. But most of the Korean army managed to cross the Yalu River and uh, station on one of the largest river islands, Wewado, which is right over there. That is Wewado, and it belongs to North Korea. Uh, but things were not getting better for the Koreans because that evening, the Yalu River flooded again and drowned hundreds of soldiers. The morale of the army was at rock bottom. General Yi song didn't want to go on anymore and sent messages to Kim Wu saying, uh, we can't do this anymore. This is too hard. But General Yi song efforts were futile. The decision from the court didn't change and he was told to march on. So, Two weeks later, on May 22nd, General Yi song Rui made up his mind and uh, marched on. Not to Liaodong Peninsula though, but to the Korean Peninsula. 
he swiped his army straight into the capital, which altered Korean history. It was later known as Wei Huado Retreat. Very quickly, Kaesong fell. The anti-Chinese party was completely wiped out, and Qin Wu was dethroned. And four years later, Li Songgui founded Chosong and became the supreme ruler of the Korean Peninsula. By the way, this uh, boats behind me uh, are all from North Korea. Zhou Enzhang was overjoyed to see a pro-Chinese regime was now running Korea and was especially thrilled when Yi song -ye formally renounced the Korean claim on Liaodong. So in exchange, Zhou Enzhang left Samsung untouched and moved the Tialing garrison first to here and later to here, which is still called Tialing after all these years. The border between the Ming Empire and the Chosun Kingdom was agreed to be the Yalu River, which after all these years is still the western border between China and North Korea. But it didn't take too long for a new problem to appear. You see, the problem of having rivers as borders is that the river is a living thing. Sometimes it changes courses, Sometimes it disappears, sometimes it dries up and shrinks, and sometimes it floods and grows in size. And almost all the time, there are some islands in the river. The Yellow River might give people the impression of always being mighty, engulfing everything, and leaving no land in between. But in reality, there are as many as 205 river islands in the Yalu River. And these islands are not just any islands. These islands have some of the best soil on Earth. And many of them are big enough and important enough to outer history. So here comes the question to both the Ming government and the Chosen government. If the Chinese on this side of the Yalu, and the Koreans on that side of the Yalu. What about these islands in the middle of the river? Who owns them? So during the 15th century, the Chosun government allowed conditional exploitation of the three islands between the lower branches of the Yalu River. This helped the peasants and soldiers of Weiju, which is about 70 kilometers that way, who would have struggled to make ants meet due to the small size of the arable lands in Weiju. And the Chinese peasants and soldiers from Liaodong were also thinking about it. They too wanted to exploit the rich soil on these river islands. So very quickly, this border region, especially those river islands, went out of control. Sometimes the Koreans on those islands would come over and steal from the Chinese. Sometimes the Chinese from here would go to the uh, islands and uh, steal from the Koreans. Smuggling, killing, human trafficking, and all sorts of illegal activities were uh, unstoppable. And as a matter of fact, illegal crossings and smuggling activities are still going on to this very day. Now, at the turn of the century in the early 1400s, with two new countries stabilized and strengthened, it was time for expansion. The Chinese wanted to dominate Manchuria, so they sent troops all the way to modern-day Tyr and set up the Northern Regional Military Commission in 1409. The Koreans also assembled an army and started pushing north. The Jurchens quickly found themselves caught in the middle. Both Chinese and Koreans wanted their allegiance and tried to win them over. In the end, the Chinese won the tug of war. Most Jurchen tribes in Manchuria, except for the Wild Jurchens, were at peace with the Chinese and accepted vassal status to the Ming Empire. However, 
The Chinese dominance of Manchuria only lasted 26 years, and the Northern Regional Military Commission was abolished in 1435. The guards continued to exist for about a century, but these were all nominal offices and no troops were stationed. And that meant two things for the Koreans. First, these Jurchens were now literally getting out of control. If we don't fight them, we could be in great danger. Two, in theory, if we fought well, we could now expand our territories north and drive the Jurchens out of the peninsula without any interference from the Chinese. And they were right. The moment the Chinese let the guards down, the general Jurchens went rogue and started plundering Chinese and Koreans, killing border guards and enslaving captives. In 1433, the Koreans couldn't take it anymore. They defeated the Jandu Jurchens, expanded the Chosun territory all the way to the southern bank of the Tumen River, and installed 10 garrisons there. By 1450, the southern bank of the Tumen River was under firm Korean control, forming the border between the Koreans and Jurchens, which is now the eastern border between China and North Korea. While the Koreans were expanding north and winning battle after battle against the Jurchens, the Chinese were also fighting a war and found themselves on the losing side. The Mongols came back. Well, to be fair, the Mongols were never really away. I mean, that's why the Chinese built all these gigantic walls from the ocean all the way to the heart of the Gobi. The sole purpose of the Ming Great War was to stop the Mongols from coming back. So the Great War might be able to stop a uh, group of horses from crossing, but uh, it stood zero chance in the face of an army with fearsome soldiers and great engineers. So very quickly, the Mongols figured out a way to breach these walls and started a new wave of raidings and border clashes. However, in 1449, things got a bit out of hand at a fortress called Tumu, 80 kilometers from Beijing. This time, the Mongols killed over a quarter of a million Chinese soldiers and slaughtered about 20 of the most experienced Chinese generals. And to their greatest surprise, among the people they captured was the most important man in East Asia, the emperor of the Ming Empire himself. And instead of celebrating this enormous victory, the Mongols wasted no time reaching the nearly defenseless Beijing. It was the darkest moment for the Ming Empire in over 80 years. But miraculously, the Chinese stood their ground, put another guy on the throne, successfully defended Beijing and signed a deal with the Mongols. The peace was restored, but the consequence was everlasting. This is the easternmost point of the Great War, Wushan Great War. And the country on the other side of this wall is North Korea. But the consequence of the Tumu crisis in 1449 was everlasting. It was a wake-up call for the Ming Empire's frontier defenses. And it was also a turning point for Ming foreign policy from an offensive to a defensive poster. And to make matters worse, when the Jurchens heard about Ming Empire's catastrophic defeat, they went rogue stopped paying tribute to the Chinese and started raiding again. The Ming government finally came to the conclusion that these so-called great walls were far from great. In fact, they were not even that good. So the Ming authorities were like, okay folks, we have to upgrade these walls. Otherwise, the Mongols in the north will just keep coming back and now in the northeast, these Jurchens know we are weak. And who knows what they're going to do to us. So folks, please, let's just make these walls great again. So beginning in 1457, the Ming Empire began to focus more on reinforcing and constructing new walls to cover 
literally every inch of his northern border. Wow. Man, great wall. Whew. I take it back. It is still pretty great. The news about the Chinese catastrophic defeat quickly reached Manchuria, and Jian Zhejiang's recently defeated by the Koreans turned a spearhead and focused more on looting the Chinese. For the next 18 years, since 1449, the Jian Zhejiang's made sure there wasn't one peaceful day in Liaodong. The Great War failed the Chinese again by being useless. Everyone was scared. Soldiers abandoned their posts and Liaodong lost so much population and livestock that the economy was shattered. The Chinese emperor couldn't take it anymore. Between 1467 and 1479, the Chinese allied with the Koreans devastated the Zhenzhou Jurchens twice. Their chiefs were captured and killed, hundreds of villages burned, livestock was taken away, and thousands died. After two devastating attacks, the Zhenzhou Jurchens finally bent their knees and stopped raiding. But the problem was that the Jurchens had an incredible capacity for pain, sacrifice, and grudges. And this thing between Chinese, Koreans, and Jurchens was not over. By 1469, the Great War was extended to the bank of the Yalu River, transforming this previously half-empty buffer zone into a heavily militarized zone. In fact, this part of the Great War is so close to Korea, you can literally see North Koreans working in the field from here. During the 1480s and the 1490s, the Ming Empire built even more fortresses and the watchtowers like this towards the border region, getting dangerously close to Weiju, Chosun's northwesternmost uh, fortress, which is right over there. So naturally, the Koreans were alerted. And this ongoing construction of the Great War it gave the Korean government a lot of anxiety. So for the next 100 years, there was a lot of drama between the two governments regarding the ownership of these river islands. Like I said, these are not just any river islands. These are huge, huge islands and this perhaps some of the best soil on this planet. But despite the uh, high tensions, uh, the two governments did reach a consensus on keeping this border region depopulated to prevent border trespassing, smuggling, and secure uh, respective jurisdictions. Oh, look at the stairs. But all this would become less important because east of the Korean Peninsula, Japan was finally united after 125 years of division. It had loads of experienced soldiers and hundreds of warships and was eager for expansion. In 1592, under the leadership of Toyotomi Hideyoshi, a united Japan for the first time in history launched a war on its two neighbors. The war was extremely bloody, lasting six years, six months, three weeks, and two days. Before the Japanese retreated, more than 100,000 Koreans, 100,000 Japanese, and 20,000 Chinese would be killed. Japan was hit hard by the war. The de facto ruler Toyotomi Hideyoshi was under a lot of stress and died three months before the war ended. For the next 265 years, the Japanese government banned any military expeditions to the Asian mainland and closed its borders. 
However, this war drew the Chinese and the Koreans closer than ever. Past grudges were reconciled, mutual understanding was achieved, and the two peoples were unprecedentedly connected and friendly to each other. But this honeymoon wouldn't last very long, because while the Chinese and Koreans were fighting the Japanese, the underdogs in Daejeon that had been bending their knees for over a century were left unattended. And they sure made the best use of the time working things out among themselves. A new Jeonjo Jurchen chief quickly rose to power. He and his sons not only put the Haishi Jurchens under control, but also subjugated the fearsome wild Jurchens in the north. His name was Nurhachi. When the Chinese and the Koreans finally realized something had gone wrong, uh, it was already too late. The Jurchens were fully united and formed a new identity, Manchu. So much. And they were so ready to avenge themselves. They took on prey thousands of times their size and succeeded. They were the founders of China's last empire, the Qing Empire. I have another confession to make. Remember the Heaven Lake you saw earlier? Yeah, that took me eight days to film. Let me explain. While you watch me making hot pot. So right after I filmed the ruins of Kokolu, I took a bus to the foothills of the Holy Mountain, ready to ascend. However, the weather here was not like this. This is actually why uh, people are leaving Northeast China, Manchuria, including the Manchus themselves. I mean, even the Manchus left Manchuria because this weather is too fucking bad, unpredictable. Yesterday it was 10, 15 degrees Celsius, and tomorrow it's gonna be minus 10. And this rain, or turn into snow in less than 12 hours. Told you. Little did I know, that was just the beginning of a very long week. You see, the holy mountain is holy for many reasons. And one of them is that it's incredibly hard to even get close to it. Especially in November, when it's most magnificent with everything else covered in snow and Heaven Lake still ice free. The snowstorm at the top is no joke. To ascend safely, the weather must be perfect. Otherwise, any sudden gust of wind could bring crowds of people into Heaven Lake. Or more like Hell Lake. This is hot pot sauce. It's it doesn't look very pretty, I admit, but uh, this is actually pretty tasty. You're probably thinking, hold on, that's not how you hold chopsticks. Don't leave tofu outside, are you crazy? Okay, who told you to put flatbread into the hot pot? Why do you make so much noise eating? And... That is definitely the most unacceptable way to eat. Desperate time, desperate measures. By the way, there's a daily forecast that tells you if the Heaven Lake is open at about 7 a.m. So that was the first thing I did every day. Day one was a no, and so was day two. But instead of staying in the hotel room and cooking incredulously delicious food, I went on a day trip to the nearby county where Kim Il Sung grew up. More on this in part two. Day three turned out to be a no as well. Disappointed, I went for a walk in the local market and found a lot of these. The forest frogs. The fresh, the dead, and the dry. And I must say they did absolutely nothing to improve my situation. Day four. It snowed again. No heaven lake for me. 
I binge watched House of Cards and lost a bit more faith in humanity. Day five was another no from Heaven Lake, but luckily I met several friends I met in Russia a few years ago, and before we could bring back the good memories of blacking out in Lake Baikal, we blacked out again. Nastrovia. I've been waiting for the weather to get better at the foothills of the mountain for exactly six days now. Just waiting and waiting and waiting and not being productive. The sun went down at about 4.30 every day and the snow was absolutely ruthless. That's actually why alcoholism and suicide are such a big deal in northern countries because the days are too short too dark and just too damn quiet I don't know about you but alcohol helps a little Unsurprisingly, day 7 was yet another no. At this point, my patience had run out, and so did the things I wanted to do. And just as I was about to give up, day 8 arrived. This good news. But the bad days never last forever. Look at this. Today is a beautiful day, and they finally opened the... Uh, this region for visitors. Been waiting way too long for this moment. <sighs> Not giving up easy. Unlike every other volcano, this mountain is also imbued with its mystical qualities. The rich volcanic soil gives birth to so many species that cannot be found anywhere else, including the mystical and magical herb, ginseng, that had cured and killed countless people throughout the history. And you know, people back then, they don't see mountains like this very often. And uh, for most, this was the only legit mountain they knew. So very quickly, this place has become a secret mountain to the uh, surrounding communities. Both the Manchus and the Koreans considered this place as their ancestral land. This place is said to be the birthplace of the Korean civilization and it is the national symbol for both the North and South Korea and is mentioned in both national anthems. Oh, so cold. For Koreans, Baek-Tusan is the symbol of national unity, Hanala, one nation. And the Manchu government uh, also considered this place as their ancestral land and a symbol of their imperial power. The founders of the uh, Qing Empire believed uh, their ancestor was also born in this mountain. And in a span of 123 years, Four Manchu emperors came here five times, including some of the most influential rulers of China, such as Emperor Kangxi, Emperor Yongzheng, and Qianlong. The Manchus went so far, they actually sealed this region for hundreds of years. 
making sure no one but the royals could visit this place. In a nutshell, this holy mountain, Changbaishan or Baekdusan, is the definition of legitimacy and has been the subject of territorial disputes for centuries, which continue until today. By the way, this is actually a live volcano that erupts every hundred years. The last eruption was in 1903, so yeah, better get going. This holy mountain wasn't the only place that was closed to outsiders, though. The Manchus also closed this entire region. In 1644, when Manchus conquered China proper, it was in turmoil. People in southern China were still loyal to the Ming Empire and never stopped resisting. The Manchu government in Beijing could be overthrown by the Chinese at any moment, so they came up with a backup plan. To safeguard their base in Manchuria where they could return to in case this ruling China thing didn't work out. So they did. The Manchus cut off Manchuria from China proper, banning non-Manchus from entering. They wanted to monopolize all the resources in this region and preserve their Manchu culture. But to achieve that, simply cutting off Manchuria from China proper wasn't enough. The Manchus also needed to cut it off from the Korean Peninsula, which meant it was time to demarcate their border with the Koreans. So in 1712, after a pretty bad border clash, Emperor Kangxi sent people to meet the Koreans to do exactly that. The border along the Yalu River was agreed upon quickly, because the Chinese and the Koreans had already spent a lot of time demarcating the Yalu River. But this holy mountain and the Tumen River were never formally demarcated, so things got a bit tricky. You see, for a river, it is very easy to find where it ends, because it gets bigger and bigger downstream, with smaller rivers and rainwater joining it. But if you look in the opposite direction, finding where it begins is almost impossible. Because the more you go upstream, the smaller the river becomes. A river is a lot like a dream. You never really know how it begins. In the end, the Manchus and the Koreans found three sources for the Tumen River. After a lot of discussions, the two agreed on the source of the Tumen River to be this one in the north. As for the Heaven Lake, the Manchus claimed all of it. After the demarcation, things in the borderland didn't change much for the next 173 years. However, the 1712 demarcation wasn't so satisfying to the Koreans. They were especially upset about having zero ownership of the Heaven Lake. But they didn't dare to confront the Manchus. Not yet. If the Yalu River can be called a monstrous tyrant, then the Tumen River is a damsel in distress. Compared with the mighty Yalu, the Tumen River is barely more than a piddling stream, shallow with gentle currents. But when it comes to territorial disputes, one damsel can bring down a tyrant. Mm, this might sound crazy to you, but for centuries, no one knew exactly where the Tumor River was, and its secret is hidden in its own name, Tumen. What does Tumen even mean? Well, it turned out that Tumen is neither a Chinese word nor a Korean word. It is the Mongolian word for 10,000 Tumen. And guess what? The Manchus use this word too. And so do the Turks, Hungarians, and many nomadic tribes in Eurasia. It's a very popular name for people and places. There's in fact an oblast in Russia, over 4,600 kilometers away from the Tumen River, also called Tumen. So what Tumen River really means is 10,000 rivers. Which is a weird name for a river, because by the same token, 10,000 rivers can be called the Tumen River. But if you look at the map, you will quickly understand how it got this name. 
There are just so many rivers in this region. Maybe not ten thousand, but definitely a lot. And they all merged into one right here before entering the Sea of Japan. So when we talk about the Tumen River, are we talking about this river, or this river, or this river? The nomads back then didn't want to bother with the name. They were like, uh, "Okay, folks, we are just gonna call this place Ten Thousand Rivers." This might be a minor issue if the Tumen River is inside of one country, but when it serves the border of two countries with a lot of conflict of interest. It is kind of important to know which one is the Tumen River. In the 18th century, when the Qing Empire was at its height, dominating East Asia, the Tumen River was agreed to be this one down here. But if there's one thing we've all learned from history, it is that change is nature. Nobody can stay on top forever. Not even the Manchus. By the mid 19th century, the glory days of the Qing Empire were decades in the past, and the West was knocking on the doors of its Asian neighbors. After two opium wars and countless rebellions, the Qing Empire was a setting sun. Within 50 years, everyone wanted a piece of China, and the one that gobbled the most was the Russian Empire. And among all the lands the Russians took was this big chunk right here. Outer Manchuria, the size of seven England, and their appetite was only growing. So to stop the Russians from eating away what was left of Manchuria, the Qing government finally relaxed the immigration ban in 1860. Millions of Chinese rushed into Manchuria and started working on this virgin land. But they were not the only ones coming; the Koreans also arrived. Because as the Qing Empire was crumbling, the Joseon Kingdom was also crumbling. Famine and rebellions consumed much of the Joseon Kingdom's strength. Waves of hungry Koreans crossed the Yalu and Tumen rivers and settled in Manchuria. And very quickly, the Manchus noticed something very special about these Korean farmers, and even changed the law to welcome even more Koreans to come. Because these farmers were particularly good at one thing. Growing rice in high latitude regions, which is something extremely hard to do even in North China Plain, let alone Manchuria. However, these resourceful Korean farmers who had to fight the harsh climate and terrains in northern Korea figured out how to do it. Along with the rice came an efficient irrigation system that Korean farmers developed. This transformed the Manchurian tundra into fertile farmland, which still produces some of the best rice on earth. Seeing what these Koreans were capable of, the Manchus lifted the immigration ban on the Yalu River in 1875. Within four years, over 37,000 Koreans crossed the Yalu River and settled in Liaodong. A few years later, the Qing government lifted the immigration ban on the Tumen River as well, and designated a special settlement area north of the river for Korean immigrants. To own land, they just need to get a proper license and pay taxes on time. This was a wonderful deal for both the Qing government and the hungry Koreans. More and more Koreans came to the settlement. By 1881, Koreans had already opened up over 8,000 hectares of land in the Tumen River basin and formed a majority of the local population. Meanwhile, as time went by, more and more Chinese settlers also arrived in the Tumen River basin from the west, and it didn't take long for tensions to emerge. The Chinese accused the Koreans for illegal crossing, and the Koreans accused the Chinese for farming in their settlement. Seeing this tension building up, in 1883, the Manchus decided to reduce the Korean population in the settlement by sending the ones without legal status back to Korea. That, however, triggered a lot of anxiety and anger among the Koreans who had just built their new lives here and got nothing back home. The Korean government was notified immediately and sent people to look into it. But you see, the Korean government had its own agenda going on. It was never happy about this deal between the Qing government and the Korean farmers, which resulted in massive population and tax revenue loss in the north. It was eager to bring them back, and now with this mess going on between the two peoples, the Korean government was trying to figure out what to do. Then, 
a light bulb went on in his head. Why don't we just take this land? That way, we could not only bring back the lost population and tax revenue, but also expand our territory. So the Korean government started sending a message that went viral among the Koreans. It argued that the Koreans didn't need to go anywhere. This land they moved in a few decades ago was in fact part of the Joseon Kingdom. The Manchus had no right to make them leave as they were still on Korean soil. The local Koreans were of course overjoyed by this, but the Chinese farmers and the Manchu officials were dumbfounded by this nonsense. They were like, how on earth did this settlement we designated for you suddenly become yours? The Korean government of course came prepared, and when questioned by the Qing government, they brought back that centuries-old question. Where the heck is the Tumen River? As mentioned earlier, the word Tumen is neither Chinese nor Korean. But to use this word, you kinda have to write it down somehow. So based on the Manchurian pronunciation, the Chinese wrote it as Tumen and the Koreans wrote it as Tumen. I don't know if you can tell, but these two words, Tumen, Tumen, they sound just the same, because they are the same river, only written differently. But in 1885, Korean officials suddenly started to argue that Tumen and Tumen were two different rivers, Tumen being this one down here, the border river Tumen being this one up there. They argued that these Korean farmers crossed Toman indeed, but didn't cross the border river Toman. So technically speaking, these Korean farmers didn't trespass at all. And the locals even had a name for this region between the two Toman rivers, Kando or Jiandao in Chinese, which literally means the Midway Island. And this Midway Island was the prototype of the modern-day Yanbian Korean Autonomous Prefecture. The Qing government was amused by this. They were like, how did this nonsense create even more nonsense? Nevertheless, the Manchus agreed to demarcate the border with the Koreans again, 173 years after the 1712 demarcation. Between 1885 and 1887, the two governments demarcated the border twice, the Korean government finally admitted that the two Tumen rivers were actually the same river and was this one down here. But since they still couldn't agree on the source of the Tumen river, both demarcation attempts failed. Two years wasted. And while the Koreans and Manchus were fighting over the two Tumen rivers and the Midway Island, the empire across the sea was turning into a superpower. Alright viewers, I'm afraid I have to end part 1 here since people don't usually click videos over 1 hour long these days. I learned that the hard way. But uh, worry not, I'm not a big fan of cliffhangers. The second part has already been made and uploaded which you can find here. Take a break and I will see you in a bit. Cheers.